We're in the final stretch, y'all. Thank you all so much for uh, a great two days. I have to say that um, I was hesitant about it when we um, when I left my um, my home on um, Wednesday morning. Um, Luckily for me, though, it was only a 45-minute flight from L.A., so. <laughs> but I knew that many of you all had been traveling um, since very early morning, so I was worried about that. But I, a few of you have come up to me and said you were really grateful for the time together and the space to be together. So <laughs> I want to give, I, uh, thank you all for giving yourself a hand for being open and following um, Sela's advice, I think, by chatting with people, getting outside, walking, and learning something new. This is uh, just a brief conversation because um, I know that at the top of uh, the program just yesterday, Anne-Marie Slaughter mentioned that Pitt UN would be transitioning out of New America. And everyone has come up to me to say, what does that mean? And so this conversation is um, my response to that. And um, I want to um, welcome Katie Knight to my left, the president and executive director of Siegel Family Endowment. I think uh, a little secret that you don't know, some of you may not know, is that Katie has been with us from the very beginning. <laughs> Down from my day one, always. <laughs> and I just want to um, let you know that, you know, as the director of Pitt UN, I've had um, the privilege of working with universities and community organizations. And um, just a head nod to what Safia said, it has been really tricky, y'all, to get y'all to break out of silos and do that power analysis and recognize that it would be really good to figure out how we can collaborate together and use the limited funding that we get, because someone's just established what that funding looks like, and figure out how we can work together. And so um, I am really excited to have this conversation with Katie because Katie has heard that and has been challenging all of us to imagine a different way of doing this work. And so I'm gonna start out by just saying that Katie's approach to inquiry-driven philanthropy emphasizes evidence-backed tools and long-term thinking, principles that resonate deeply with Pitt UN, as you all have heard over the last couple days, and Katie has been a consistent supporter of uh, my work and has been a partner and a helpful guide many times when I've been frustrated, so I'm really happy to have her up here with me to talk about how we are going to be working together in the next phase of Pitt UN. So Katie, one of the things that um, has come up quite a bit is um, this question of capital. So at your inaugural Tech Together event on Roosevelt Island, just in September, you invited Lucid Capitalism to talk about the gap in VC investment in Silicon Valley compared to philanthropic investment in Pitt. I wanted you to talk to us about why you're sort of bullish about their work and what does that mean for the future of Pitt? Yeah, I, so Lucid Capitalism is a sort of boutique firm that works with VCs and other investors that want to do things differently and think about capitalism that can be of service and not just to profit, but to, to people and the public. And obviously we've heard a lot about the public, the public good and the public interest here. And particularly our last panel very juicily gave us, I think a lot to think about in that regard about capital allocation, capital flows. I think to Darren's point, grant dollars are different from investment dollars and we need to think about what we are looking for when we're talking about designing and deploying public interest tech. Are we looking to build something that fits in the bucket of nonprofit work, that fits in the bucket of more traditional grant work? Or are we looking to actually garner investment in products and platforms that could be broader than just sort of the niche? And so that's where I think the overlap between the more traditional grant investments in the notions of public interest technology, in the research that underlies it, in some of the organizing activities, student clubs, the work that we're doing to sort of build a backbone is really important, but we have to figure out how to bring in a relationship with the private sector that, one, convinces and helps 
VCs understand the value of some of the tools and tech that we're building, but also looks beyond the model of venture capital. I think we are as caught up as anyone else in the notion that like it's either VC or you have to get a grant for it. And there's a wide variety of capital that exists in between those two extremes. It doesn't all have to be concessionary, philanthropic, you don't expect to get a return on this. And it also doesn't have to be you expect to make $100 million off of this. In fact, I think you know VC drinking their own Kool-Aid has made themselves so much bigger, I think, than even the fundamentals of their business model means for them to be. You don't need VC investment for most things. In fact, you don't even need VC investment for many technology-driven things. You can think outside the VC box and think about patient capital, which philanthropy can be. It can wait longer for returns on investment. You can think about limited sort of opportunity for growth. What if something returns 10% instead of 1,000? What if something returns a reasonable amount of money that you can then reinvest into community or reinvest into employee ownership and co-ops? Like that, that box that we, are, we have put ourselves in and the binary that we keep referring to is troubling to me because there's so much more out there and we should be looking at sort of different capital flows to achieve our goals and not just sort of trying to hammer down the walls of VC when they don't necessarily know what they're doing anyway. Like, I don't think we need another Uber for whatever. Like, I don't need more ways to get pizza to my house. I am lactose intolerant. Like, no more pizzas. But can we think about, you know, transportation? Can we think about climate? Can we think about things that actually serve real needs and what the returns on those kind of investments might be and the appropriate capital for that? I think we can, and I think VC, traditional VCs have demonstrated to us that they can't because they continue to fund the same largely stupid things over and over again. Well, you've called it stupid, but I think in other places you've been um, a little bit more gingerly. You said, um, you've spoken about funding deeply unsexy, yet critical areas in education technology like addressing the digital divide, which came up today, um, rather than just some latest trek tech trend. Um, can you talk to me a, a bit more about this approach and how it will uh, intersect with public interest tech? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I like to say unsexy because it gets people's attention and because it's, I really am drawing a contrast between the things that I get in my inbox or you might see in the news, you know, this flashy new chat GPT based bot that's going to serve the entire LA Unified School District with information that they need for parents and students, right? Like, and when you think about whether that's even possible and what the underlying tech would have to be, like the opportunity to build that sort of thing in the long term could be huge. But in order to get there, you have to invest in data systems for public schools, in interoperability between in-school and out-of-school time providers to be able to share student data in, uh, sort of digitizing things, you know, from, from bus routes to class schedules, right? And so those kinds of technologies in education specifically can be incredibly powerful and useful and have like great use cases, but you don't hear about them on the news. They don't get a special feature on, you know, 60 Minutes. They're not flashy and shiny, but they are deeply necessary. And I think, you know, going back to what I was just saying, public interest tech can be civic tech, it can be gov tech, it can be sort of the nonprofit focused, community focused things that we need. That's super important. But building in the public interest can also mean that we're building tools that can make money and can be a part of sort of future larger tools that could be commercialized, but they're being built to serve and they're being built to serve as infrastructure. Not all infrastructure is built by government. So much of it is actually built by private companies, is built by community institutions, is built by others. And so that infrastructure is what I wanna prioritize in what we're doing with public interest tech. Um, I think one of the things that came up in the last round of conversations and I think Cynthia talked about is that sort of the persistent um, skills gap in STEM and some of the, the students that uh, she encounters and the work of partnering together. Can you talk a little bit about the investments you've been making in that space? Because you've been doing this for quite some time, particularly with the CS for All work and some of the other things that have been you've been doing. Yeah, I think, and I wanna sort of 
give a nod to something that my colleague Allison Scott from KPOR and I have been sort of noodling on, which is, you know, we've done a lot of work in K-12. We've done great work with Public Interest Tech University Network. We've done work to help expose more young people to computer science, to computational thinking. But at the end of the day, we won't have the technologists we want and need if we don't make sure that from K-12 to post-secondary to career, there are opportunities for them to get what they need need to become those people. And so when I think about those gaps, those knowledge gaps and, and gaps in math and science in particular, we have to do a better job of preparing students. And so that does mean that the post-secondary spaces, and not just colleges and universities, but other sort of post-secondary educators, need to reach back into schools and be more collaborative and thoughtful about what they're looking for in students who are coming in and how we can make sure they're prepared. I think there are a ton of great like microcosm examples of that between community colleges and you know a few high schools in a neighborhood and we can scale that sort of thing. But we've also got to think about like how is this infrastructure for someone to see themselves understanding you know, from, from kindergarten, from being a small child and understanding what a computer is and what it does really, through sort of elementary and middle school, getting those skills to start to understand how to create with technology, how to do more than just play a game or be exposed to an app that helps you learn math, but to build your own things. We've um, been longtime investors in Scratch, which I'm sure a lot of you know, block-based programming language for young people, but it's about sort of learning how to create, not just get exposed to a front screen, but to get exposed to the back end. And so thinking through the, the line of like, how do you really encourage young people to have interaction with technology that they have agency in? And I think we have given up too much agency to technology, and I want for us to be able to reinstill that sense of agency in young people so that when we get to college, they're looking at the world not just you know, through the lens of, should I get a CS degree so I can go work at Google or not, but how can my continued skills development with computation allow me to do what I want to do and what I think the world needs? And so we're really thinking, like, what's the through line for a person to have that opportunity if you come from like where I come from in New York and didn't really have access to opportunity until I got involved in programs and things that, that gave it to me. How do we help more kids starting from where I started from have a different outcome and opportunity? Um, I think one of the things I want um, to make sure that folks understand is that uh, uh, the Ford Foundation and you all began talking in that creation story. So can you give a, just a little bit of background on that? Because I believe that sometimes that gets a little bit lost. Yeah, um, so I've been with Siegel, oh God, for, for like eight or nine years and we've been, and that's most of the life of the organization and I think for, from the beginning, what we were doing was public interest tech, but we didn't call it that. Um, and I don't know that we would have come up with that name. We were thinking about open source and funding that and we were thinking about science and we were thinking about computational thinking and scratch, but all of these pieces for us were like, this is just what we need to do. We need to help infuse tech across these many verticals. We need to help understand what's happening with tech and society. And so when Darren and, and Jenny Toomey from Ford came to us and said, do you want to do this public interest tech work with us? We think this is really important. We think it's crucial. First we said, sure, but like, could you think differently about the acronym? Because we don't, we like our work and we don't want to call it PIT. And we did not win that argument. And that's okay. Because I think the value has been in, in being able to give name to this community, give name to the work that we're doing create something, like sometimes you don't, you don't win on the branding front and that's okay. <laughs> We're still doing the same work underneath that. And I think the fact that for so many others, it's been a way to find a home, a way to find a space that's like, oh, much like the experience that I had when saying, oh yeah, like this is our work. Like I don't necessarily, I wouldn't have called it that before and I don't know if I want to, but 
it actually is the space that we need. And so I've happily now adopted Pitt and will say it and love it and be a part of this community because it is exactly the community that we needed to build. And, um, and I won't let you off the hook, but can you talk about <laughs> uh, the breadth of investments and the types of things that um, are exciting to you about um, Pitt and um, what we can look forward to? Yeah, look, I'm not a person who spends a lot of time like thinking about my talking points in advance, but I knew. No, who, she is not. Oh, no, I'm not. I will tell you there are no talking points in this document. I wrote one thing down, and then I don't even think I've said it. I, I did think to myself though, like, well, okay, what are you gonna say? You know, you're doing this this fireside chat after the election. You don't know how the election is gonna go. It's gonna happen, and so I was like, well, for better or for worse, I can always say we've just had an historic election, and now we're really in a moment, <laughs> and we are. And I, I'm excited. I'm finding that excitement. I'm drawing on my reserve power, fueled by that excitement, because we have laid groundwork on the ground. And so pit regions, these pit hubs, the work that we're doing across this network and the way that we are coming together to create the nodes that will blanket the country, that will create the league of public interest, technology, designers, developers, evangelists, and all of it will still exist. And it will, th it will thrive no matter what, even if it takes us a little longer to get there. My eggs have never been all in the basket of federal policy. I've always been more excited about state and local work anyway, because I like to see the tangible outputs of what we're doing, and you see them in community. You see them at the local, organization that is able to sort of digitize their services and double the audience that is receiving information about voting in the next election, for example. You can see it in the relationships that are being created in rooms like this one. When we have this summit every year, I always have the opportunity to talk with like a student or someone who says, I'm so glad that we found this work because now I can do X or because now I can take what I was doing and level it up in this way. So I'm really excited to continue to engage at that level and know that what you all are building, which I get to take like third and fourth hand credit for somehow, is still going to exist. I am not going anywhere. I may take a long nap this weekend, but I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be here to champion this work at the highest levels. And so I want you all to keep doing it on the ground. Uh, so that means that I'm not out, I'm, I'm not left out in the cold. You will have a job as long as I have the power to, <laughs> to put funding into this network, yes. Um, and we'll keep going, like I think, I think we, we've been talking about pit regions and how jazzed I am about pit hubs for 18 to 24 months, I'm like it's not a new thing. Yes, so I think what I wanna suggest here, and I, 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 this is one of those moments where I'm gonna do a talking to because I've heard the conversations and I've heard the whispers and you know I'm gonna do it anyway, so I may as well do it now. Um, I, when I said I was bullish on the hubs, I think Cynthia also made the point about how we can work better together and um, how we can understand our relationships to the pipeline and what it means to have multiple institutions so close together and not work together. And um, I think the lesson I've learned running this network for the last five years and the forcing function that the network challenge offered up was we had, we asked you to collaborate and I don't know how many times many of you have said, oh, someone down the hallway is working on the same thing that I'm working on and I never knew it. And so um, it has been a challenge, but I think we are beginning to understand the punchline a little bit, which is that we are in this together. We have found community with each other and we're gonna have to shore each other up as we do this work. And that has been part of, I think, a long-term conversation that we've been having about regions and what it looks like to shape a conversation together and a consortial relationship um, with each other. I think the Network Challenge Grants Program, we, we did encourage you all to work across departments, across institutions, 
But uh, I think the future of this work, I'm just declaring it now, is um, our, as in the hubs. And we are going to work to support your capacity to continue to do that labor. But I think one of the things that Safia um, helpfully pointed out is the sort of power analysis that's necessary, particularly when we think about our relationships with a network, which by the way, I do have a network of overwhelmingly predominantly white institutions. So when people come up to me at conferences and said, let's talk about how we can work with MSIs, guess what? It's actually not just MSIs. So this is an institution that is really valuable for that reason. It has always been important to me that you all produce 70% of the technical talent that goes on to create all of the companies that people talk about in Silicon Valley. That was what was attractive about this work for me. And that's one of the things that I think is really valuable that we have to own. And so I think one of the things that's really exciting and thrilling about I think the next generation of this work is for us to double down on supporting you all with resources, see I'm nodding and looking, um, multi-year funding <laughs> for, um, for the hubs and for us to um, craft and shape that world that Cynthia asked us to do in terms of reaching back and reaching across and reaching around the neighborhood of institutions that we have, um, that are right in your backyard. And I've been so excited to see the folks from Stanford, um, UC Berkeley, San Jose State, Cal Poly, all the folks here saying how they're gonna work together. And, um, and you all know that we have some Starting, starting hubs with the Midwest. We have some in the New York region. We have, um, sadly, we're just, you know, we're gonna revisit the HBCU in the South with, um, you know, with Kevin's passing, but that is still a commitment that we have. And um, many of those things are coming up. So I just wanted to offer you just a bit of kind of um, insight into the thinking and the work that we have been trying to shape. And before we uh, go too far, I just wanna give Katie a, a final moment to mention anything that she might wanna mention that uh, has struck her as she's listened to your conversations, particularly the last panel. Yeah, I you know, I think just to pick up what you said, I really, we can't play the, the game anymore of like how do we f solve for the lack of resources by like doing duplicative work and fighting with each other. And I don't th I think that what we've built in this network is really like f several forcing functions to try to eliminate that like competitiveness and instead have a collaborativeness. And I want to see that flow through to the next phase of the work. So whether we have an official challenge or an, uh, an official sort of hub designation or you're just doing a collaborative project with people that you've met in this room or in the work, like we want to see more collaboration and we want to help facilitate more collaboration. So um, our team at Siegel is also working on some of this mapping. We're working on trying to bring some of these resources that Safia was talking about so that we can have a better understanding of where we can also help point people to each other. I think a lot of the time, you know, we are forced to choose between grant proposals or ideas that seem really similar and have great leadership. And instead, I'd like to be able to say, look, here's work you can do together if you choose. We don't want to force that, but we want that to be the preferred option as we look at our collective ability to get anywhere with this, which is again, like why the hubs and regions and thinking about just collective action happening on the ground feels really important. We're gonna to have to keep our eyes on community more than ever in the coming days in every way, through this work and in personal ways and in profound ways that we probably cannot even realize yet. And so anything that we can do to promote that community collaboration feels incredibly important right now. And I hope that, that you all can agree with that and can carry that forward. Not that I'm giving marching orders, but like that we can all carry forward this notion of like let's build in community more than anything else. Thanks for that, Katie. I want to thank you for joining me on this closing conversation. I am um, immediately going to ask our co-host to come and join me. But first, I want to just do a round of thank yous. I have to, have to do a round of thank yous. I'm not going to win an Oscar, so this is going to be my moment <laughs> of doing that, maybe. Um, <laughs> no, or shouldn't I foretell the future in that way? But personally, I want to thank New America 
for stewarding this work um, for the past five years. There's some special nods, but I have to give them out to Anne-Marie Slaughter, Cecilia Munoz, who was my direct supervisor for many years, and Alison Price, who runs Digi, who often pulled me into rooms and said, this is how the federal policy landscape works. So um, all of those sort of mentoring um, that happened was so key for me. And I also want to thank the advisory board of donors, especially our advisory board chair, Jenny Toomey, for also being open to bringing me into rooms and introducing me to people um, that cannot be undersold, that that was a very valuable thing that for me. And I also just want to thank my extraordinary team at New America. Many of you will know them, and unfortunately, Brenda is always conscious of time, so she said she was making a jet. So Brenda Pereira is not here, but of course, Elise St. John, who has been helping us with our regional work and is your point on that. I also want to thank Bantisha Flood. She makes everything go. Um, Kip Dooley, who did such a really wonderful job with the uh, um, studio and the live studio. But at the same time, I have to thank Renee Cummings for pinch hitting in that. That was really wonderful. Um, I also want to thank Alberto Rodriguez Alvarez, who always helped us hold that global perspective on our team. And um, our newbie, Nia Brazel, for all of the student work that you are doing and the student clubs. Thank you so much for marshalling that student club track. And um, Jasmine McNeely, our Pitt Fellow. Thank you, thank you. I know that was really fast, but I'm still gonna say it. It's just like the Oscars. I can't stop, I have to say it. And then um, my special advisor, All Things Cyber Plus, Afua Bruce. A four Bruce, a four Bruce, a four Bruce. <laughs> and our summit partner who has been with us ride or die really from the very beginning in the middle of the pandemic. Oh my gosh, we can't do it at ASU. We're gonna have to do it virtually. Mary, can you help me? Mary Woodworth at Wildwood Strategies. <laughs> you have seen her walking around making everything so beautiful. And then Beth Norber of BN Events. That's what's made all of this really possible. So thank you all so much. And Sela, please close us out. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you, Andrine, always. I have no idea how to put a period on this sentence, so I am not going to put a period on this sentence. I'm going to invite us all into the next stage, that this was not a transaction. We didn't come here for a couple of days and get some cool information, a little bit of inspiration, and then we're going to go back to our regular lives. Um, I opened this uh, event by inviting you to do three things. I want to see if we accomplish those three things. Who learned something, truly learned something? Raise your hand up high and be proud of that. Good on you. Who met somebody and was inspired by people in this room? Right on, and we did an A plus job. I gotta thank a couple of people as well. Um, our SJSU events team and our AV team has been behind the scenes too, making things run smoothly, thank you. I hope you felt the strong presence of our faculty, our deans, and our cabinet members here contributing to all of this. Um, we, like I said, are, we're proud of the work that we're doing here. One of our big challenges in the beginning was like, how do you define Pitt, and where is Pitt happening at SJSU? The answer is everywhere. It is embedded in our identity. I really encourage you to reach back out to us. If you met um, a faculty member here that you think their work is interesting and there is something that you could collaborate on in the future, please reach out. If you didn't get their contact information, I'm going to kick myself for saying this next week, um, but email me and I will get you in touch with them. We want to partner. There's a whole lot of work to do in this world. And I think that the way we do it is we all get in the boat and we start rowing in the same direction. And we lift one another up and we encourage one another and we listen to each other on the hard days. And we encourage 
the young people around us to believe in themselves because the work is not going to stop. Like I said at the beginning of this event, before the election, chop wood, carry water. After the election, chop wood, carry water. Before the summit, chop wood, carry water. After the summit, chop wood, carry water. And with that, I would like you to just take a look around the room at the people here. Look at the people at your table, the people across the room. Take a little snapshot in your mind, because we know there's going to be some days ahead of us that are going to require that we remember the good, compassionate, kind, dedicated, smart people who are doing the good, kind, compassionate, dedicated work in the world. And for some of you, you are at your institutions with not a big posse like I have the blessing of rolling with here. Some of you are doing a lot of that work with a very small team or alone. But please remember that we are all, all with you and we are all behind you. And the last thing I want to do, I okay, here's the real deal. I've had five presidents at this institution and nobody is like this woman right over here. So I would love it if you would give her a gigantic round of applause. For all the ways that she not only leads us, but also rolls up her sleeves, grabs a shovel, and does the real and hard work. So thank you. And I'm about to lose it if I say too much about Andrine, but Andrine, you are my sister. I am so glad to have met you, and thank you for all you do every day. I think Andrine deserves a, a standing ovation, so if we could do that for her. Thank you. All right, I, I'm, I'm Gen Z, and, and, and the later Gens, they like to make fun of us for our ellipses, so I am not putting a period on this sentence. True to my generation, we're going to ellipses this, and thank you all. Please go out into the world and do your good work. Thank you for joining us here for the past two days.